Everyone has a story. Stories have power. They help us understand. Jessup's Journal is a collection of powerful, positive, and inspirational stories. It's time for Jessup's Journal. Hi, this is Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journal, where we share powerful, positive, and inspirational stories and music. We're going to have a lot of fun in this episode. I did the first television interview with a former jazz bear. We do treasures remembered. We do a little traveling. But, you know, we first start up with a very interesting man that owns this little ranch you might have heard of. Skinwalker Ranch. Up next, Brandon Fugel. Welcome to this episode of Jessup's Journeys. With me today, Brandon Fugel. So, Brandon, you and I have been keeping in touch for quite a long time. And, you know, we're both on TV, but you got a, a what a heck of a following. You got this little show about this you know, little piece of property you own out in the basin. Right. So what's going on out there lately? Well, The Secret of Skinwalker Ranch, which is presently in its fourth season, airing 14 episodes, uh, it really documents the scientific investigation of the, uh, the most intriguing paranormal hotspot on the planet. It is Mecca for the paranormal. Many refer to it as the Private Area 51. I assembled a team of scientists and experts years ago to study whether there was any truth to the claims of high strangeness that had, had gone back decades, if not millennia. And to my surprise, of course, there is truth. And we're documenting it and have allowed a television docu-series format with the History Channel and A&E Network to go forward. Uh, it is a hit, thank you. Oh, yeah. And has captured global attention. Uh, it was recently the number one ranked uh, download on Apple TV and uh, continues to build an audience. Okay, I'm going to put you on the spot here a little bit. Okay, I've not prepped you with these, so okay, I'm going to say, no, okay. bring it on. If you had to say, I'm going to ask you for each season, what was something that, I don't know if surprise is the right word, but something that you found that you go, uh-huh. Okay, so in, in season one, what was, the, what was that aha moment? The aha moment for me was when Dr. Taylor... Uh, upon seeing the ranch for the first time and going with the team up on the Mesa Plateau to uh, to survey the property, started seeing incredibly high levels of gamma radiation and microwave energy. Uh, Dr. Taylor, who has you know multiple PhDs in physics and has done work with the Department of Defense, NASA, and others, uh, was left dumbfounded. Uh, he, he entered as a skeptic and professed his skepticism mm -hmm. early on. And, uh, As did you. Yeah, and he started seeing things that, that frankly, defied any natural explanation. That was the, the aha moment from the first season, as well as the cow dying under mysterious circumstances. The fact that we had this unusual death of a perfectly healthy calf on the property that, uh, that was attended by elevated microwave and you know radiation levels and for at least a year or more after its death remained untouched by any scavengers captured the attention of the Utah State veterinarian mm -hmm. and other experts that uh, that carcass to this day remains untouched by scavengers and just is withering away you know the maggots in because, the, yeah. in the yeah. elements yeah but uh, the the death of the cow, which also was accompanied by a UFO that was captured on camera. Minor little detail. Above, and, uh, and the, the strange circumstances surrounding its death, coupled with Dr. Taylor's realization that there was more going on than met the eye there at Skinwalker Ranch, really kicked off the docuseries in a dynamic way. You know, season two, we brought a team of uh, multidisciplinary experts to the property, on one occasion, we brought a rabbi, uh, Rabbi Ariel Zadok, who is a, a very respected spiritual leader mm -hmm. who, uh, who proceeded to pronounce a rabbinical chant, a prayer that he claimed uh, earlier uh, would potentially open portals uh, or doors to spiritual realms. Well, we set up a FLIR camera system, a $35,000 thermographic imaging system uh, to record the environment during that sequence, during that experiment, and that exercise with Rabbi Ariel Zadok, 
To our shock, the environment immediately changed. In the middle of July, the temperature dropped rapidly hmm. within seconds around the homestead and in the doorway of Homestead 2, where a lot of this activity continues to be centered. It was black. It was freezing cold. Our head of security, Dragon, was sent to go investigate, and as he walked through the threshold of that doorway, he described it as walking into a deep freezer. In July. Wow. In July. And mm -hmm. when that, uh, that whole exercise ceased, the temperature quickly returned to normal. Mm -hmm. With the scientific method, what do you do? You repeat. Well, days later, we repeated the experiment, playing back the audio from that rabbinical chant and observed a similar change in temperature. But on that occasion, a light appeared in the back room of the homestead. Now, there is no light fixtures that are working. There is no power working in that old pioneer homestead presently. So to see a light appear in the back of that homestead and then uh, capture some strange phenomena passing through the pasture behind was something that uh, really set everyone on edge. Uh, you know, season three. Season three brought a lot of new revelations and insights. Uh, most notably, we brought the Salt Lake Astronomical Society to the property. We brought a team of seasoned astronomers with tens of thousands of dollars worth of equipment and a closed computer system for really charting the stars, constellations above the ranch, situated in the area of the Triangle, which is a, an area of the property where we have seen UFO activity and other, other strange anomalies. Well, when they proceeded to try to conduct that research and those experiments, to their shock, the star charts right above the Triangle were deleted. They couldn't see. Their, their equipment malfunctioned. Now, Bear in mind, this is a closed system. Sure. They'd never seen anything like this happen. And then in the midst of, of the experiments, they saw a UFO. All of them, all of the, the professionals that were present saw a, uh, a glowing object that, uh, that descended from above. The, the interesting thing, if people have been out to the basin, there's not a heck of a lot of light pollution out there. No. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it's out yeah. in the middle of flipping nowhere. Well, it left them completely shocked. And, you know, several of those, those individuals did come onto the property as skeptics, didn't believe that there was anything unusual happening, and left completely in shock. Uh, to have a team of experts that, uh, that witnessed their, their technology manipulated, a closed system that wasn't hooked up to the internet, could not be accessed by anyone from the outside, completely manipulated before their very eyes, and then UFOs or UAP appear, mm -hmm. uh, it was it was a shocking episode. Okay. Season four. Boy, season four has has raised the bar that much more. Uh you know, one example that has captured the public's attention was an exercise that involved over two hundred drones that were carefully calibrated, a drone swarm experiment that uh, that was conducted over the infamous triangle and resulted in not only those drones, all malfunctioning, and also seeing rapid battery depletion mm. that defied any explanation or anything that they had ever seen. But again, a UFO ends up appearing coming down out of the sky mm. for everyone in full view and then ascending back up into the clouds where it completely disappeared. Over 40 professionals witnessed these events. We documented all of the rapid battery depletion, the GPS anomalies. For example, the drones, which operate with GPS, mm -hmm. uh, were having a difficult time locking in and were malfunctioning, which is not unusual. We've seen that happen over and over, whether we're using instrumented rocketry, balloons, my helicopter, uh, you know, airplanes with, uh, with professionals. We've seen these GPS anomalies that continue to, uh, to be observed and documented over the triangle. That drone experiment and the dramatic events that were observed and documented led to a whole new series of experiments and research. Oh, yeah? 
that continues to unfold. Uh, get ready, because I think the the episodes to come are going to uh, to reveal, I think, some of the most compelling evidence that there is truly strange activity uh, happening on that ranch, and uh, and we're we are focused on trying to get to the bottom of the agenda and the origin associated. Now, Brandon, I don't know if it's coincidental and it's kind of a chicken and the egg situation, but you and I talked a while back. And when you started the show, you were skeptic and you found all this interesting stuff over the, the seasons. But it's also interesting that Congress and the military have now declassified so many documents that are basically saying, hey, this has happened, this has happened, this has happened. And we're talking like, you know, NASA pilots and all kinds of crazy stuff. So that begs the question, okay, you've got Skinwalker Ranch, you know, here in little old Utah, but there's got to be stuff going on somewhere else. Are you able to address that at all? You bet. And I'm glad you asked because we have a new series that we are unveiling right now called Beyond Skinwalker that takes the investigation beyond the borders of Skinwalker Ranch, utilizing additional investigators. We have an Emmy Award-winning investigative journalist who has done work with PBS, with ABC. We have a former CIA investigator, a graduate of the Air Force Academy, retired Air Force, that have joined forces with our team, reporting to our principal investigator, Eric Bard, and our uh, science consultant, Dr. Travis Taylor, and have gone out into the field to investigate sites not only across the country, but also worldwide. Today on TV Travel Man, we go off the coast of Africa to the Canary Islands. The Canary Islands, located 82 miles west of Morocco, consists of seven main islands and is a major tourist destination. It's easy to see why this Spanish territory is so popular. We visited the most populous island, Tenerife. The thing you notice right off the bat is the incredible climate. The island had warm summers and winters warm enough for the climate to be technically called tropical at sea level. Here's something you might not know. At over 12,000 feet, Mount Titi on Tenerife is the highest peak in all of Spain and the third tallest volcano in the world from its base. That volcano provided what I have to admit is my favorite thing about Tenerife, black sand beaches. Oh, baby. The views are breathtaking. It was a lot of fun to see the tropical flowers and foliage, including the Canary Island pine and this unique tree called a dragon tree. Now, one of the biggest cash crops is, you ready for this? Bananas. Mm. Of course, let's not forget the Canary Islands have an official bird. Okay, people. One guess. That's all you get. One guess. What's the official bird of Canary Islands? Yeah, it's the canary. Broadcasting from the Canary Islands, I'm Doug Jessup. One of my favorite inspirational quotes is from Audrey Hepburn. She said, to plant a garden is to believe in tomorrow. Right here, right now. What is Eric Dowdle thankful for? Wow. Uh, favorite question you anybody's ever asked. Okay because I now know how I'll answer this. And this is, has to do with something that I believe happens after we pass on. Imagine getting to the other side after all your life's experiences. You will walk up to people who you did not like, who caused you so much struggle and challenge and problems, anger, hate, all of those deep-seated emotions that were so difficult and you'll walk up to that person, and I every time I think about it, you know, I think of different people like that, and I, tears running down your cheeks. You will hug that person, and you will thank them for that experience that they gave you. Because I believe, again, your, your bad are just as important as the good, and 
I am thankful for those challenges because now I look back and I mean, like, if it didn't kill me, yes, it did make me stronger, but that's not always the truth because it can kill you. And I've had three heart attacks along the way, but I, I believe that where I look at all the people that have caused problems or struggles or challenges and they're what helped me become who I am. And if you don't like who you are, then you need to look at those experiences different. Yes, I will enjoy and th be thankful for all those who did good things for me. But really, the most growth I ever had, or what I'm, it's the challenges. So I believe I'm grateful for the experiences. That is it. Um, I'm lucky to have had some really hard experiences and some amazing experiences. Though so it's, yeah. I and and if you're if you haven't forgiven somebody in your life, tell yourself that story. And hopefully it'll get you there. I think that's the most important thing we can learn. And, and you'll be more grateful when you see it that way. Everyone has a story. Objects with stories are treasures remembered. Hi, this is Doug Jessup. Welcome to this episode of Treasures Remembered. With me today, Dr. Micah Christensen from Anthony's Fine Art and Antiques. Now, Micah, um, okay, I'm going way, way, way back. Okay, back when I had hair, you know, when I was in high school, I was the president of the chess club. And this kind of looks familiar, but this is pretty special. Oh, this predates even you, Doc. <laughs> this is this special. You, know, you could you could not buy these when these were originally made. They were made in 1962 by the aluminum industrial firm Alcoa. Oh yes. Okay, so these these were not for sale by Alcoa. These were made as gifts for clients at Christmas time. Oh wow. Uh, they are uh, and and you may be wondering why would a giant firm based in I believe Ohio, Akron, Ohio be making uh, chess sets that it was giving its clients as its gift. And chess sets have been made of many things, but but to make one out of aluminum, I mean, that is a that is an unusual uh, uh, material to be making anything out of, right? It's a work of art, though. And you have to think that what's happening in the 1960s is the space race in the Cold War. Uh, of course. Right? So the United States post-World War II is is a uh, ramping up aluminum production they're using it for all kinds of materials and they're trying to get into space faster and better than russia is at the same time um this game which has been called war as a game right a, a proxy for war is literally the cold war that the united states and russia is going through oh yeah bobby fisher at age 14 in 1964, won his first Grandmaster Championship. But when this may, was made in 1962, uh, this was made after several humiliating eras when the United States had bragged that it was going to send a Grandmaster mm. that would beat the Russians. And when I look at this, I don't know about you, but I immediately have the uh, the small world theme come to my oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, It kind of looks like a small world set, right? And that's because this is a 1960s design. The artist who did this, his name is, he was Austin Cox. And Austin Cox, uh, you'd be forgiven if you had no idea who he was, because he mostly created aluminum doors. Hmm. Um, he created telephone poles. He worked as a designer for the... Uh, for, for the aluminum industry. Mm -hmm. And they came to him and they said, we want, a gift as a, we want to give as a gift these chess sets, but we want them to look beautiful. And we want them to look like, huh, we're, we want them to kind of look like that cool designer at Disneyland, Mary Blair. Okay. Mary Blair, who designed The Small World. She was behind Cinderella. And uh, Alice in Wonderland was, well, yeah, was part of what she did. Because you can see kind of the, the smooth lines. I mean, right. It's kind of medieval meets, you know, new age. It is, isn't it? And it's, it's when you look at, this is in terrific condition. This is the original aluminum board, the original blue felt that's on there. And um, you can, both sides have the same color raw aluminum on the front. But on the sides of these, 
You have uh -huh. the anodized black that's been put onto them in the inside. It took me a little while. I talked with a chess expert who said, oh, you have the John Wick set. Oh, because really? This is, uh, this is featured in the John Wick movies. This came out of a storage garage <laughs> no way. In, uh, in Idaho where it was given to an Alcoa executive who moved out west, was uh, never used it, put it in his garage. Uh, his kids it, didn't know exactly what it was. Yeah. Pulled it out and uh, gave me a call, and I immediately knew what it was, but I didn't know how to put it together because some of these, clearly the bishops are religious. Mm -hmm. Clearly, you know, these are the castles, but these are also religious. It wasn't until I realized that that's a shield. Yes. Right. There's a shield with the cross yes. inside. Right. So the holy warrior. It is a lot of fun to play with, but I don't think that this would meet tournament st uh, uh, standards of a tournament. <laughs> I mean, you were you did tournament chess. When you look at this long enough, your eyes adjust and I go, what the pieces are. Yeah. But I've played a few times where my six year old has beaten me because I was confusing <laughs> I was I was confusing one piece for another. Yeah. Well, you know, I always love having you come on and objects, you know, they have stories. They really do. And this one is certainly one of those. With another entry into Treasures Remembered with Dr. Michael Christensen, I'm Doug Jessup. We'll be right back. Our next guest is a really fun friend, and he's a little crazy. I'm just saying. It's John Absey. Boys and girls, children of all ages, in today's Jessup's Journal, wearing double zero. A teddy bear kind of guy from East Grand Forks, Minnesota, John Abzi. Wow, that was that was pretty amazing. <laughs> that, was, that was Dan Robert esque right yeah. there. So for people that don't know Dan Roberts and the little comment there, and you know the teddy bear and all kinds of stuff, uh, introduce yourself. Um, my name is John Abzi. I, I was the uh, original jazz bear for 25 years, and. Uh, I got out here, like you said, it was from East Grand Forks, Minnesota, and by complete chance and luck, uh, I made it to uh, Utah to be the mascot for the jazz. How in the world did you get in to be a jazz bear in the first place? It was totally by accident. It actually found me. Um, I had worked uh, in a bunch of CBA teams, which was the Continental Basketball Association, mm -hmm. while I was in college, because when mm -hmm. I was in college, I was going to... Uh, Moorhead State University for uh, political science and pre-law and I was as a part-time job I was working for the Fargo Moorhead acro team and uh, I I lied on my application and said I was a gymnast <laughs> <laughs> and I went in and I just would watch what everybody else was doing to uh -huh. correct gymnastic movements okay. and I just taught myself and then after classes I would stick around and I literally taught myself how to tumble and how to do backflips. In basketball okay here is you know they're going to do a screen they're going to do blah 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 blah. Is there kind of a vernacular of say okay here is this is the name of the skit or the the, the action of the play say okay you know Bear I want you to do this. You know, because for example, everybody knows, and I think you're mildly crazy to do this, but the one going down the stairs. Yep. Okay. Does that have a name? Or just is it like, just going down the stairs? Just going down the stairs. Yeah, <laughs> okay. it's just my sled. So like, so I, I, I was really fortunate with um, with uh, our team that, you know, um, Grant Harrison trusted me so much. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> he he literally, you know, like when, when I got there, he was just like, listen, you, you're the mascot, I'm not. And he goes, you know, I'm trusting that you know what you're doing. And he also said, I'm going to give you enough rope to hang yourself, so don't hang yourself. <laughs> well, he's a great guy, so he's, I understand. Yeah, he's yeah. awesome. I, he, he, he is really what helped get the character to where it was because he, he uh, took the time to listen and understand what was going on and looked at both sides. So he was, he was an integral part to where the program went. Plus, you know, back in the day, everybody in the organization that, you know, put their hands in to help a little bit here and there. But... You know, all in all, I was kind of an island, and they trusted me enough to do what I was doing, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Um, you know, I, I know a million times I'd walk in with these ideas um, on what to do. Like one time I, I wanted to parachute out of the upper bowl, or out of the oh, rafters. Okay. And we went in, and we practiced with a dummy doll, and, yeah. and it was just a round shoot. And it was uh -huh. actually because I was in the military, uh -huh. and it was uh, a parachute that I had found. And it was a uh, for an incinerary round or a 
uh, illumination round uh -huh. for him to parachute in. And I thought, that might hold me, at least slow me down enough <laughs> to, uh, so I can hit. Uh -huh. <clears throat> we went in and we practiced, and I remember they were just like, no. <laughs> yeah, it's like not the liability the, yeah. on you has got to be insane, right? So, I mean, that, so that was fun. I mean, they, they just, they at least let me try, you mm -hmm. know, and think way outside the box. Everyone has a story. Sometimes those stories are told through music. It's time for Jessup's Jukebox with Clara Hurtado Lee. makes you smile. Spry Natural Xylitol Mints make me smile. I think it might help you too. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Jessup's Journal, where we shared powerful, positive, and inspirational stories and music. Here's the thing I want people to remember. Everyone has a story. Yes, you, right there on the couch, you have a story. Stories have power. They help us understand each other. With another entry into Jessup's journal, I'm Doug Jessup. When you do a little, try to get so trophy.